Welcome back to FUNYC, the unscripted version where we talk to people from New York about New York and their New York stories. Here, my name is Eric Wickstrom, your co-host, along with my other co-host. I'm Emily Eden. And Emily, we're talking today with a friend of mine who is heavily involved in accessibility in on Broadway, in and around Broadway. I met this woman at a event for New York Film Festival. I was doing a panel on audio description and she had the most beautiful dog. <laughs> well, I she's maybe, pretty beautiful herself, Eric. I Yes, but it, I had a girlfriend at the time and I wasn't in, you know, <laughs> I don't usually go stalking women at uh, events that I'm asked to appear at, but I saw this beautiful dogs. dog from, from across the room and I, my friend Liz was like, you can't pet the dog because it was a service dog. And I said, but I have to pet the dog. And she's like, you can't, you're not allowed to pet dogs. And I said, I'm going to do it anyway. So I went over and I asked this, what can I, may I, may I say hello to your dog? And she said, yes. And um, I did, Daisy the Wonder Dog. And we'll talk about Daisy in a minute. But through that, I met uh, Maria Porto, our guest today. And it's been uh, about a year and a, over a year now? A little over a year? Over a year. A little over a year. And we've done some things for accessibility on Broadway. And we're hoping to do a lot more. But just generally, she is a kick-ass rock star of the accessibility field, and I'm super and excited. Advocate. Yes, super excited to have her here, and that she's agreed to sit down and talk all things FU, NYC. A lot of accessibility issues is definitely an FU, generally, right? <laughs> so I think yes. that fits that fits our theme here a little bit. So so welcome, thank you for being here. Hello, thank you for having me. Of course. So you yourself have a disability that you you live with? I do. Uh, I'm hard of hearing and I also live with a traumatic brain injury slash and or an epilepsy disorder. I have my wonderful dog, Daisy, who has been with me for the last seven years. Um, and she is a uh, epilepsy or a seizure alert dog. Seizure alert dog. Why and, don't you explain to our yeah. listeners what that means? Basically, she like pulls at my clothes to inform me that something may be happening so I can go lay down. And then once the seizure has happened, she will work on ways to wake me up, whether it's like putting her nose underneath my neck and trying to get me to come back. Or to, um, if we're at home, we have a seizure bag and it's like this little lunchbox and she'll go get it and it has like sugar, water, medications, and she'll bring it to wherever I am. It's amazing. Sorry, I'm getting really choked up. <laughs> oh, Daisy's like two minutes phenomenal. In, uh, we're here to talk to Maria, but we're yeah, going to get sorry. into... <laughs> this happens a lot. We'll get into that <laughs> also. Uh, Daisy gets a lot of She's attention. Great. She is She is the best. So um, and again, has ruined me for, for most dogs at this point. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So, yes. So now, uh, there's just been things you've lived with from from forever, when you were first born, or is there things that have developed over the years? Yeah, no. Um, I grew up a hearing person without a disability at all. Uh, when I was 19, I was diagnosed with late adult onset epilepsy, which was pretty controlled. I got, uh, I was a protester in my younger life, a political protester. Um, and I was picked up and thrown by a New York City police officer on the back of my head and I developed a tra uh, traumatic brain injury and my epilepsy got a lot worse and my hearing was affected. Um, and so I've lived with it since then. I think I was in my 20, 23, so about 10, 11 years. So you were, you were living with it already, and it was greatly affected and made worse by this, uh, by this event with, yeah. with this police officer. I did not know that part of the story. Um, and as far as the hearing? Uh, so my hearing, I actually was sick. Uh, I had uh, viral meningitis and then uh, lost a lot of my hearing from that. What, what age was that? I was 26. Oh, so this is all... Later. So you grew up... My 20s were rough. <laughs> it's a rough time. Uh, but you grew up uh, in New York City, or where did, we, where did you grow up? Between here and Connecticut. Okay. So, like, we would split... Most weekends were here. Brooklyn and Manhattan. Brooklyn and Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, as far as... I think that people... I think the, the disabilities people have the hardest time with are the invisible ones, so to speak. Yeah. Because if you meet you, you're... Hey, I'm speaking to you now for people listening. We're looking directly at each other, and I could forget... <laughs> as she shimmies for me. Uh, I could forget that you you are hard of hearing at all. Like, we're talking, and it's just back and forth, no, no question at all. I just did it before we came on the air. I asked her something, mm. and she was like, you're not looking at me. Like, what do you... I can't hear a word you're saying. So... And then the epilepsy thing, obviously, you, you can't see that. So go. can you talk a little bit about some of the things you encounter as a disabled person without a visible disability 
that might be unique to you and folks like yourself? Uh, it's rough <laughs> occasionally. So, you know, I, I do recognize that I have a lot of privilege. I grew up speaking. I grew up hearing. Um, so my journey into the hard of hearing, deaf, hard of hearing community is a lot different than most people's. Um, however, going into places, I constantly have to prove myself, right? You know, people, when I go in somewhere like, oh, you don't look disabled or you, you speak so well for being hard of hearing deaf. And I'm like, Thanks. Um, that's wonderful, but I still can't hear you if you're behind me. And so like the, the flip side of that is a lot of people think I'm really rude. Um, I've had wonderful, this one friend comes to mind, Jeremy, and I'm so sorry. I have this wonderful friend named Jeremy and we were helping another friend move and he was behind me like carrying the back end. And I guess he was talking. And at the end he was like, wow, I thought you were the rudest person. Like our friend didn't like tell him that I couldn't hear him if he was behind me. And I guess he was talking this whole time. And I was like, I was like, no, nah, I just don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> but we're such good friends now. And so like that does happen a lot, especially in this city, right? Because when you're passing people on the subway or you're passing people on a bus or you're going to this, that and the third places, we don't stop to think, um, oh, maybe she can't hear me because she's speaking to this other person, right. right? But I have to be facing that person. So a lot of people sort of don't know where to place me. They're like, mm, you travel around with the dog. Do you really need her? Is she emotional support? And I'm like, nah, get the right kind of strobe lights and we can find out, but let's not do that. So that, <laughs> that interests me because, again, I think a lot of people associate service dogs as seeing eye dogs. Yeah. And that's the end of it. And I know we do have emotional support animals, which, yes, there are some that are very needed and others that are complete, you know. Agree. So, you know, nobody needs to support llama or whatever. Horse. Horse, things yeah. like that. I just want a llama in general. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, who doesn't like a good llama? <laughs> Get on a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, llama. <laughs> so. Llama lover. So Daisy being trained, like how does a dog get trained to recognize seizures? So, okay, so that's the other part, right? They can't tell you that the dog can do this. It's something that certain dogs are more in tune with. And there's a huge disclaimer when you get a service dog. Like, they may not be able to alert you. They're trained as seizure response dogs. Mm -hmm. But some dogs will. And so, like, you always kind of go into it with that mindset. And, I mean, scientists think it's a combination of your scent and something that's ha like a vibration that you give off mm -hmm. before that the dogs pick up on. Um, I, I will say when I first got her, you know, it had been like a month or something and we were cooking and she just started going a little crazy. And I was like, do you need to go outside? Like I'm cooking, just wait. And she kept doing it and she kept biting on my clothes. And I was like, I will take you out in a minute. Just like chill out. And then I started to feel an aura and I was like, oh, I'm just dumb. Got it. You, you're <laughs> just like, got it. No worries. Right. And so like, and so I really started to like, learn how to listen to her and learn what her signals are and learn how, what she feels because she, she'll feel it long before I will. I've been around when she does that. She'll nudge your hands and she gets, you know, annoying, to be honest with you. Yeah. And she'll just keep up with it. But it's her job. Aww. No, it's it's her job. But she is demonstrative about it. She will, <laughs> like... It's, it's not subtle at all. Right. Yeah. It's, and, it's a very wow. big, like, an over-the-top reaction. But I've never... I've actually never seen you have, you know, a seizure of any kind. So... Is it something that you can, like, can she kind of cut it off at the pass? Like, you could sit down, or is it like, is how does that work? Is it no? So, like, what the times where you and I have sat and down, I probably had what's called an absent seizure, so I don't like fall down, mm -hmm. do that kind of thing. Um, there's no real stopping it, there's stuff that I can do afterwards for like self care. What but now, what is an absent seizure? It's, it's a seizure, same thing, but it's not like grand mal seizures are on the floor, your body is shaking, sometimes you lose uh, the ability to control your mm -hmm. body, all that kind of stuff. Absent seizures to people who are not experiencing them may look like someone just kind of staring off into space for a minute or it's just like a little burst of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, so something like that. So so you can, so that's another thing people don't realize. A seizure doesn't necessarily mean falling on the floor and, you know, and, and having flailing limbs and all that kind of thing that people, I think, associate with that. It yeah. can just be something you don't even recognize. So that's a lot to deal with, right, day to day. Like, a little bit. In terms of, again, managing people's expectations of the dog and managing their expectations of what disability looks like and, and everything else. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I think, like, 
you you personally know me, but for the people who don't and the people that are listening, I do at least 10 different things at once. I never am sitting very still. And so I think a lot of people don't understand what goes into my disability. I do. I founded this company with the idea that disabled people could have a place to not only be consultants, but have their health looked after and celebrated. Mm -hmm. And so like a business model that I have is if you are not, if your disability is keeping you from doing work for today, great, just let us know and we can move stuff around. So like we schedule three meetings for one meeting. So we have a rain date and a second rain date just in case more than half of our team can't come in. Right. And for me, that's given me a lot of freedom to work because on days where I'm, you know, feeling great and feeling wonderful, fantastic, I'll get a lot of work done. But then there are days where my epilepsy and my traumatic brain injury keep me in bed. And on those days, I have to have something that's super fluid that I can work on. So like uh, when we were on tour, I had an understudy for my role who could go in whenever I needed. Um, right. And that gives me a lot of freedom to keep up with my work. So where did you go to school? New York? I finished high school at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Performing Arts. Um, and then I went to Bay Path for like one semester. But then I finished out at John Jay. Okay. And you went on what for what? What did you go for? Forensic psychology. Forensic psychology. Wow. And from there? Uh, from there, I got my EMT and decided to start riding an ambulance because I am going to have a problem with adrenaline and mm -hmm. did that for a bit. And then I got my injury. But there's a performing arts thing here, right? You're, you've done you've done things with that. So where did that come in? Uh, I... <laughs> my childhood was crazy. Um, I... I'm a three-time gold uh, medalist for Junior Olympics in rhythmic gymnastics. And then, unlike most people who say they're going to run away and join the circus, I did. I did a performance with Cirque du Soleil for the kids' performances. And then... In what area? Like, what were you, like, flying around on trapeze or...? Aerial fabrics. Wow. It was fabrics. awesome. Um, it was the best time. Uh, my dad used to take me to practices up in Vermont and drive, like, three hours each way. And he's the greatest. Um, and then I joined a couple dance companies and then they got me into the Academy of Performing Arts. And so I did dance and musical theater. Dance and musical theater and, but, but didn't go to school for it. High school. Um, I was, you didn't, but not college. You didn't pursue it. No, I, we did the, we were the first licensed production of Cats outside of Broadway at that particular school. It was like a $2 million production. Right. Um, and then after that, I just went to college just to kind of try something new, I guess. And I dropped performing for a little bit and then picked it up like regionally. Right. Which comes full circle in a minute. Right. We're going to talk about that. But, uh, but I'm sorry. You have an, I'm, I'm... <laughs> well, I have a question, but now I feel like I'm jumping all over the place. That's how I live my life. <laughs> yeah, me too. I have grasshopper brain. So... Obviously, after your accident and then the meningitis, the viral meningitis, and so then you can't hear, did you have to learn sign language and reading of the lips? And as an adult, things take you longer to learn. So how long did that take you to learn? I'd say a good year. Um, probably, mo and mostly because it was done kicking and screaming. Uh, there was a very, and I talk about this in some of my presentations, but there was a moment, especially becoming disabled later in life where you have to really grieve the person that you were. Um, and I think a lot of people don't give that enough time. Um, <laughs> I didn't do it in the healthiest of ways because uh, I was young and kind of angry. But in that, I went and I had amazing teachers. My uh, amazing mentor when I first started the theatrical career was Alan uh, over at the Sign Language Center, and he has passed on in the last year. I can't believe it's been a year. Um, but he really was helping me understand, like, grammar for sign language and, like, getting involved in community events and, like, finding other later, what we call late in life, deaf, um, hard of hearing people that I could relate to. And it was hard, like, not having that, you know, growing up in that community or having that kind of support from community because I didn't know anything, right? I was a 26-year-old mm -hmm. kind of moron. Um, and so finding that and finding that support system was awesome. And then, so here's a New York question that might be dumb. <laughs> so when people, like, say, tourists, for example, might approach you to ask you for directions and they're speaking a foreign language, can you just tell that from the way their lips are moving? 
I can tell that I don't understand them. So I'm, I'm like, <laughs> and they usually go away. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. I can just bugger off. Yeah. You know, I got caught with that one time and uh, Trishel Edmund is going to kill me, but we were walking one time and we were signing, having a conversation. My friend Trishel is deaf. Um, and, <laughs> And, you know, the Mormon people who ask you if you mm -hmm. want to come to church, we both were like, mm, sorry, can't hear. And they were like, that's okay. They started signing. <laughs> They're like, we have deaf church. And we were like, oh. <laughs> it's like the only get out of jail free card, but then we couldn't even use it with them. You couldn't hit them up with like, I don't speak English at that point and sign that? Nah, because I'd already seen us speaking ASL. Yeah. And so we were like, mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, so much for that. <laughs> so you went for forensic... Psychology. Psychology. Winner. And you were riding on the back of ambulance rigs. Yes. In New York City? I was in Connecticut for that part. Okay. Which must have been some gnarly evenings. Oh, they were so great. I miss it so much. <laughs> did the did the disabilities prevent you from continuing doing it? Yeah, it's kind of hard to be responsible for someone else's health care if you're not exactly sure. Like, and there are many, many people with epilepsy who conti continuously have great careers in EMS. I'm not saying that. I'm saying my particular kind of epilepsy where I had breakthrough seizures and things mm. like that. It wasn't It wasn't safe to be in charge of patient care or to be driving an ambulance. Right. With, to be responsible for two other people, sometimes three in the back. Right. Um, so I, I made the decision to kind of walk away. For me, like knowing nothing about you, it's clear that you've you were born to help people, like even pre-injury. Thank you. I think that comes from my dad, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad has always kind of been like this super big rebel, like taking on city council or the Department of Education or whatever. And when I was in middle school, we founded a program where kids could go and work at a homeless shelter. And it was an after school program. It was like a club. Um, and my dad helped me like prepare a speech for the board of ed and the town council. And so like he's had a lot of influence on what I do and what I choose to do. So I'm not very surprised that this kind of was the route. Right. I love that. So before we move on into your, you know, the stuff on the Broadway and access and all that good stuff, I want to talk real quick more about Daisy. Huzzah. Uh, again, I, the dopey guy who knew better, approached you about petting your dog from across the room. Now, people, I'm sure, because she's awesome and beautiful and sweet looking, you must get approached daily from people that want to pet your dog. I do. Yeah, and I'm, me being one of those dopey people. <laughs> But what are the guidelines that you could give people about approaching a service animal? Don't. Um, so <laughs> it's not just about, like, asking permission and, like, saying, hey, I love your dog. Your dog is super cute. Just the dog is – think of the dog like a wheelchair, right? It's a piece of medical equipment. You're not going to sit there and stare and make googly eyes at a wheelchair because that would be super weird. So – in that same turn, if she's distracted, then she's not focusing on me and she's not focusing on the possibility of a seizure and she's not focusing on her job, right? And I get this all the time on the subway where I'll be sitting down because she's underneath my mm. my legs and people will talk straight up to my crotch where she is. And it's just, it's very invasive. And so I like to tell people like, if, if it's not a dragon on the subway, it probably doesn't need to be paid attention to, right? It's a dog. We see dogs every single day. We can let the working ones work. Um, and we can let the ones in little carriers who are dressed up like Simon, you know, those ones can be pet. Absolutely. But in distracting the dogs, it gets dangerous for the person. So it's better just to leave them alone. And if you're act interacting with a person that does have a service dog, talk to them. Um, the dogs, like, historically have a really bad time responding. They don't speak English. So, like, you know, it's just better to address the person. Right. And if you do happen to do that, you could wind up on a podcast <laughs> with them. This is also yeah. true. Yeah, a year later. So I also, I also take it case by case. I feel like in our particular line of work, we get a little bit more freedom. Right. And, again, it was um, when we met, <laughs> there's Daisy weighing, getting her two cents in. I think at that time, too, it was uh, I approached you, we were talking, and then I, I asked permission to. It's probably harder for you because, again, with, with a silent disability or, or invisible disability, it's people probably just assume she's, even with the, with, with the vest on, they just assume she's an everyday dog. They do. It's wild how many people don't read. 
Um, and I, I will say kids are way better about this than adults. Mm. Yeah. Um, the kids will, I've seen kids be like, that's a service dog. And right. their parents are like, I can't pet it. And like, so I find, I find it very interesting. I think because we're so, because it's, you know, New York city, we're just kind of desensitized to everything and we don't bother to look at things very well. Um, cause if I'm on the subway, I'm going from point A to point B. I don't really want to talk to anybody. Right. Um, but if they took a minute to, you know, read, there is a big sign that says, please do not pet me. I'm working right. on the side. It does say assistant dog. So there is all the information available. People just don't really look at have it. Have you, have you ever been out and about in New York city and started to have a seizure where she started to alert you? Yeah. And what's happened in that instance of people try to like interfere or do people come to help because they realize what she's doing or what happens in that situation normally? <laughs> The two times that it's happened in public, one person did CPR um, and ended up giving me a huge bruise. Uh, shout out. I think you had good intentions, um, I hope. And then, then the other time uh, we were walking and there weren't a lot of people around, but it was snowing. Um, and I think the people around there kind of just like stayed back. But she's also trained to like, you know, protect me. And so because it was snowing and cold, she had laid on top of me to try and keep my core warm while people uh, called 911. Wow. Yeah. yeah. She's, she's amazing. skilled. She's amazing. She's the I'm best. Cry I, I didn't sorry. get hypothermia, so oh yay. I just love animals and I'm just like in awe. Of, <laughs> yeah. She's, you know. she's a top. top I, well, I will say it's amazing. impressive. So she's a uh, seizure response dog. She has a brother who's an A1C dog. So she works with people with diabetes. Um, she has another brother who assists a person in a wheelchair with mobility, like opening doors and all kinds of things. So they really have a n number of different jobs. Right. It's not Amazing. just seeing eye dogs. Her best friend is a seeing eye dog. Right. <laughs> we love seeing eye dogs. Chevelle. But, but they're not all, not all working animals are seeing eye dogs. No. Some of them all. are at the airport. Yes. Finding drugs. There's a lot of dogs <laughs> working out there. Leave them alone is <laughs> the point. Especially those ones. Her bestie is a bomb dog. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Hey, kibble. <laughs> so you have the injury, you leave EMS, and you decide at that point to get involved doing what? Political protesting. Um, such a huge jump. Uh, we were a part of Occupy Wall Street, and we had a medical collective that was doing work with the protesters, mm -hmm. um, going on marches, kind of stitching people up when they needed it, patting people up when they needed it. I did that for a little bit. Um this is after you were thrown to the ground protesting and received a traumatic brain injury from it. Yeah. You get right back out there yeah. protesting. Wow. Like a couple of days later. It was not a smart idea, but it's definitely what I did. That's commitment. I mean, at what point do you get to to where you are now with Access Broadway? Mm. And how does uh, that what how does that leave you? You're occupying Wall Street and now you're making Broadway accessible. So I'm curious, like, how we got from, from there to there. Uh, during the time when I was protesting, I met a lot of disabled people who were also protest protesters in talking about the disability rights movement and talking about um, Judy Hunan and her legacy. Um, and so I realized that I was now in this, you know, quote unquote disability category, right? Mm -hmm. And so I started making friends in the disabled community, started getting for more familiar with what options are out there for people like myself and like other people um, in our little group. And I saw that there was this huge gap in disability, especially as an adult, right? When you're an adult and you're disabled, no one gives you a packet and says, these are the services in New York City that you're entitled to, right? Um, and I had a hard time with that because I didn't really know what I needed at the time. And so trying to figure that out with this group of people um, really kind of helped me start to learn about like the 504 Act and like the Americans with Disabilities Act and all these great things that were passed, but still need a lot of work, right? And I had been involved in the theater community as a kid. Um, and I had seen sort of the lack of access in theater. Um, and then I just got mad. And so I decided to do something about it because that's kind of my MO. Yeah. Yeah. So Access Broadway, <laughs> did it exist? It didn't. At it first, at first it was just me. At first it was just me, like, talking to my friends who were actors, right? And 
I, one of the first things, you know, I remember was uh, the Ham for Ham show didn't have a place where disabled people could view it, mm -hmm. right? It was a free for all out on 46th Street. And if you were able bodied, you could definitely like fight your way to the front. And if you're disabled, better luck next time, right? right? And, and what, so, now, what year is this? 2015. 2015. So come almost 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You decide you're you're gonna you're pissed off. This is nonsense. You're gonna do something about it. You're I just wanted to see my friends in their little skit, yeah. skit show before the show. You're a woman <laughs> in, in her mid 20s, who I think again had a career and a life path completely disrupted. Yeah. A lot of people would have just gone home and pulled the covers up over their heads. You decide, no, I'm gonna take on Broadway. Seemed like a thing. Right. You know. Um, now, is it because you were young and dumb? Is that why you think, like... I think a little bit of, yeah, 100%. Yeah, like, a little bit it was a naivety. Na yeah. Naivety, that word. Yeah, I, but I know what you were going naivety. at. Naivety. There it is. Say it again. Naivety. One more time for all of us. <laughs> naivety. There it is. So, <laughs> that one. Yeah, that one. Shall I sing it? So, <laughs> again, like, you're dumb enough to think you can change the world at that age, right? That's the whole point. Totally. And you just went for it. I went for it and it worked, which was the weird part, right? So like there was an ADA section at the Ham for Ham show and it was great. We had people in wheelchairs. We had people with low vision. We had people with mobility disabilities that were then able to be a part of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, it was about convincing people that, you know, disabled people do want to see Broadway shows. They right. do want to be a part of the magic. I think I have the unique experience of both being a performer and being in technical theater um, in my youth and then coming back as an audience member who wanted to then be in the business and right. couldn't. And it's, it's not to say that I couldn't. It was just, it was a lot harder. Well, and the part, I think we've talked about it offline a little bit is, you know, the convincing thing is, you know, disabled people wanting to see shows, which of course they do. Yeah. But more importantly, those disabled folks are normally, they're part of families and families mm -hmm. want to do things together. You know, they don't, families generally don't want to go to a, do an event and leave a child home because they're disabled. That's ridiculous. So seems like fun. You're not you're not targeting disabled. You're targeting families, and and it's yeah. just crazy. Like the amount of money it costs to do these things, usually pales in comparison to the money you make having done them. And, correct. And that's the interesting thing, right? We I'm so 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 grateful this year, this past year, my company got to do two ASL interpreted performances the inaugural perform ASL interpreter performance of Kimberly Akimbo, and then we went over to Book of Mormon. And the people that are then able to come and experience the show, if that was offered more often, would keep coming. Of Let course. For the whole calendar year, one, one particular year that I'm thinking of in particular, there were 12 accessible performances across open captioning, interpretation, audio description, 12. Right. For 36 shows. Yeah. It's, so it's insanity. So, sorry, just to make this clear, there is not an ASL interpreter at every interpreter at every performance. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> that is there, insane. There's maybe one offered if the show wants it. And a lot of shows don't opt into that because of the money. Right. And how much money that makes are we me talking angry. about? $8,000. $8,000. 8 to 10, depending. For a single show. Yeah. Performance. But then, you know, if you do it more often, then we don't have to hire a team to study the show, get the timing, because they'll already have done it. So they're if it's paying eight more... to ten thousand dollars to do one show. Yeah. But then, if you're going to do another show, like how much would each additional show cost? Probably around six, seven. For each performance, okay. Yeah, but then you're making it back if you think about it in seats, right? Because right. a seat is eighty something dollars. Right. If you have the availability to do two hundred seats, you're making your money. Yeah, back. no, the numbers add up when you start looking at it that way. Especially, and then what, what we've worked together on is audio description, mm -hmm. which having it there, people will come to the show uh, much more often. So you start to almost 10 years ago, Access Broadway, it's just you against the world. At what point do you start getting some traction where this is a, a business, an actual thing? So I did some private consulting uh, throughout the beginning of my career. Um, I worked with children, which was awesome. And then coming back from the pandemic, I started getting emails like, hey, are you still doing that accessibility thing that you were talking to us years ago about? And I was like, yeah. And so, and so, so people were a lot more receptive coming back from the pandemic about accessibility. 
And I think that's because, you know, this big thing of we can't put captions on everything prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We found out in the pandemic how easy that was. Oh, we can't do audio description for everything. We found out during the pandemic how easy it was. Oh, yeah. Right. And so people were a lot more willing to start to have conversations with me. And that's when I knew I needed a team because I was like, I can no longer do this. Yeah, it forced the pandemic. The pandemic forced a lot of people to examine alternate workflows that were then be able to be repurposed for folks in the disabled community. I mean, I certainly was, I had that experience again with audio description. Mm -hmm. That's where we really as a company at IDC started onboarding and using blind voiceover talent. And it was strictly because we had to develop, it was something we had discussed doing coincidentally. And then the pandemic forced everybody to go to remote. And once that happened, it gave us the, the ability to really explore those workflows. And we still do that work now, obviously. So same thing, it sounds like. The pandemic kind of forced people to do things and you just poured it over to these efforts. And it was kind of awesome because we were talking about coming back. You know, we had DEI consultants, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but very seldomly did any of them actually come from the accessibility community, the disabled right. community. And, you know, disability and accessibility was put under... Um, inclusion. And when I started talking about, hey, listen, it really should be an idea model instead of DEI, idea being accessibility first, right? Right. Um, And having that experience from a disabled person, a lot more people have been super receptive to that. And so I started working with different theater companies and different shows. um, And it's been great. I went to the opera a few weeks ago for the first time and they have the little screens Mm -hmm. in the chairs with the lyrics, you know, in English. So is that something that you would advocate for in Broadway theatres or is it just not the same as having the piece signed by an actual person? So I advocate for both. The reason that the opera has that is because the operas are mostly in other languages, right? And so... But then why aren't they viewing... Because ASL, essentially, excuse my ignorance, like is another language, essentially. So people, you know, it needs, why not translate it, you know? That roughly would be most of my points. Um, (laughs) And, but also ASL has its own grammar. So a lot of people who speak ASL, uh, written English is not their first language. And so following along on captions when it's your second or possibly third language is a lot harder than just watching a performance in ASL. So the need for both is there. Also, a lot of hard of hearing people don't bother learning sign. Right. So hard of hearing people is ranges from everywhere from having hearing aids Mm -hmm. to having cochlear implants. Those people wouldn't sign, but they would benefit from the caption. So both are really necessary in any kind of accessibility thing. Are there headsets? So when I've done audio description for some major movies, I know people can go to the movie theater and get a headset to hear that. Does that exist for Broadway performances? Yes. Uh, right now, there is a company that does audio description and captioning. So that that does exist. It's what we're talking about now is the quality and caliber of that work. Right. What we're finding is the company right now um, and the company that a lot of the disabled community has a lot of grievances with is it's all automated and it's never actually included disabled people. Right. So like I went to a show where almost 40% of the captioning script was missing. Wow. And how how can I access the show when, you know, when when I went to see a certain show, the opening line was not even there. And then I have my blind consultant, Shane, who went to another Broadway show, and they were like, oh, I'm sorry, we just don't have the AD script for this. It's just not available today. And so, like, that, those levels of accessibility need to be checked. And right now on Broadway, there is no overarching, you know, entity that we can report these things to. They just exist. And then we send an email that we're unsatisfied with what happened and nothing gets done. And so that's sort of been my marching drive. So is that a bigger fight then? So like I heard in England, and I could be wrong, but in England, I believe that every TV show needs to have audio description by law. It's not always done great. (laughs) You know, sometimes it's just like the intern doing it, sadly, because it's an afterthought, sadly. Um... And I'm guessing that law doesn't exist here in America, right? Not everything has to be accessible. Not everything has to have sign language or audio description or closed captions. Or does that law exist? Or is that potentially something we can start campaigning for? So it does exist. It's about the level that it exists in, right? So like, for instance, uh, your CNN televised sports ball game is going to be, sorry, football? Football game. Hmm. Sports ball is my word for all sports. Um, 
they're going to have a live cart writer, right? So when it's live, somebody sits there and they, you know, stenographer tells what the captions are. On programming television, they have closed captions. On programming television, they have audio descriptions. On most movies, they have audio descriptions. Those are legally protected because um, they all go out to the public, right? So there are laws that say that we have to have these services. The unfortunate thing is in theater, Right. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act that says that live theatrical performances only currently legally have to protect assisted listening device systems. That's the only thing they have to protect. Wow. They can choose in to audio description and closed captioning, um, but that's not the legally protected standard. What does end up happening, though, is you can sue someone under the ADA if they don't have captions or audio description and you'll win. Um, but the level of quality that's currently on Broadway is super questionable at the moment. And, and it doesn't lend itself to make Broadway accessible. The reason that our numbers in the disabled community for going to see Broadway shows is so low is because this service has been bad for years and no one's done anything about it. So we stop wasting money on shows that we can't access. I don't want to pay $150 to get 60% of a show. Wow. Right. I'm like shaking my head in disbelief here for those of you listening to us. I just find this outrageous. Oh, um, me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think, um, I think, you know, what Marie's describing is, is accurate. I think two people get caught up in quantity and this conversation to start with quality. There's, there's a ton of audio description floating around on television and movies. I would estimate 70, 80% of it is subpar, honestly, in this country. Um, you know, it's just a matter of taking, it's, it's a couple of things, a people taking pride in, in caring, but also people being trained properly and supported properly to do the work, which is another thing. A lot of people just get thrown into it as an afterthought mm. and, you know, garbage in, garbage out is kind of the way it happens. So, so you got involved after the pandemic, you know, Access Broadway started to pick up and, uh, but I mean, you're just kind of alluded to it, but everything is not going great. No, uh, I mean, everything for my company is going great, sure. Everything where I would like it to be is not where I currently, where it currently is, is not where I would like it to be. Um, because of, you know, 30, 50 year old contracts that exist, most Broadway shows have to use this one company mm -hmm. um, because no one else really does it or has the system to do it. We, Eric and I, Mainstreamed, uh, and we did the first ever national tour with uh, captioning and audio description available for the entire run. We went on tour with Into the Woods. Yes. I absolutely adore every single person in that building. But we also uh, revolutionized kind of captioning and audio description because it was live gated, right? Right now, it's all on automation. So if you miss a light cue or if you miss something, mm -hmm. it's not going to keep going because it doesn't understand how to do anything. Right. Yeah. Um, if, it, if an actress twists an ankle and goes down and there's a, no, really, there's a three there's, minute, yeah, yeah. three minute gap where it'll they're covering, going. it'll just it keep just... going and you'll never catch up. So it's not a good product as it currently sits generally. So so we did live, and I sat there for every performance. That's amazing. And that was a great track. It turned out wonderfully. We learned a lot. It was a lot of work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but moving forward, so, like, best case scenario, like, do you do you think this this contract, these issues, like, do you think it'll get resolved in a, in a matter of time? And if so, when do you, when do you, when do you envision, best case scenario, uh, a family with a disabled member can buy a ticket and have full confidence that they're going to be able to experience a wonderful experience in the Broadway theater? I would hope less than five years. I have some big ideas and some big plans currently in the works, but I would, I would hope, I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, right? right? We've already seen that it can't, but I do, I will say there's a few producers who I have talked to who are absolutely and ethically on board with the mission of having every performance be accessible, right? It's Is just about- Is that where about, it falls? The producers have to have to, to care? Yeah, See, yeah. Well, the producers have to care enough to challenge a contract. Right, well, and what is this contract? I'm sorry, Emily. Is this case. contract open-ended? Like, there's gotta be an end date on this thing. I, so it's just like a standard contract that you, you sign when a show moves into a Broadway house. Right. Right, and just nobody's ever challenged it because that's the way it's been done for the last 50 but surely, years. But surely it's just a case of a lawyer finding a loophole in this old, outdated contract. But it's the want and it's the fear of that, right? So this particular company handles all the sound equipment for Broadway shows as well. 
And so sort of divorcing those two things is a little, because it's it's, it's all written as one thing. It's a little sticky. Yeah. So then how can I help? How can our listeners help? How can How can we help? make this change happen? Like, is there a petition we can sign? Is there just talking about it to everyone? Like, what can we do to really help you? Um, a petition would be a good idea. Well, there we go. Uh, <laughs> gonna write that one down for later. <laughs> no, I think it's, you know, I think it's about bringing people to shows and actively advocating for people. If you're a person, an able-bodied person who goes to see a Broadway show, ask about captioning. Ask about audio description. But who do we ask? ask you, oh, house you... house managers. When you walk in, there will be a house manager and there'll usually be a little area for captioning and audio description. Asking about it. Asking about the level of, you know, which blind consultant was consulted for this show. Was there a blind consultant consulted for this show? Was there a deaf, hard of hearing consultant consulted for this show? And most of the time the answer is going to be no. Yeah, yeah I, I can vouch for that because I actually used to work front of house with house managers who are lovely people. I love them. Mm -hmm. There's a big divide between house managers and producers, sadly. And that's the thing. I feel like emailing in to production companies. Okay. Um, I will say that's how we got we got the first ASL performance of Little Shop of Horrors because myself and Ari Groover, who was a Ronette at the time, she was annoyed that I couldn't come and see her performance. And so we had to do a lot of advocating. Um so that would be my next question. Could we not ask Broadway stars to speak out? Like, could we not like maybe like, hey, if you're a Broadway star and you're listening to our show, FUMIC podcast, <laughs> speak out, speak up and make your show accessible and share your amazing performance with those that really want to come and see you. And I will say, uh, not for nothing, shout out to Kevin Clay in particular. The entire ASL performance was Kevin Clay's, you know, advocacy. Uh, he approached me. He brought our company in um, and he said, I really want an ASL performance and, you know, I I will do everything I can to make it a reality. And he did. He talked Amazing. to the producers. He advocated. We, you know, we brought the ASL interpreters. We did all the rehearsals. We did all like, you know, all, all the prep for it, invited the community in. But it was really him being like, this isn't fair. I want an ASL performance. This person is doing great work. Let's do it. And the producers, you know, and, and shout out to the producers. The producers followed suit and they were like, great, we're making this a priority for this year. And it was awesome. Now, we got to do, which is cool, Shakespeare in the Park last summer. Yes. We did Hamlet with the IDC, did Hamlet, uh, audio description, and it was, I think, very well received. It was. Hamlet, uh, having the first accessible uh, summer season for Shakespeare in the Park is kind of a bucket list thing for me as a kid who grew up going to Shakespeare at the yeah. Park. Right. Um, who stood in those lines for hours and hours and hours to see shows. Um so to be able to provide audio description and captioning all summer to anybody who wanted it uh, was a dream. Um, and we saw a lot of users in our, you know, international uh, group come in, you know, who needed captioning. We saw a lot of hard of hearing, deaf, our wonderful people from Visions came through. Um, and so just having that level of access at every performance, not selected performances, right. was a dream. Yeah. So, again, we'll keep an eye out. If you want to, before we wrap up here with with, with Maria, we'll uh, tell us how to find Access Broadway. Uh, you can find us at www.accessbroadwayny.com or Access Broadway NY on Instagram and the Facebooks. Right, and people can go there and get information about all these things we're talking about. I'm sure there's ways to donate and get involved and support and to protest. And again, peacefully protest. I'm happy to protest for you. Again, but a protest meaning ask when you get there, hey, I need these services. Where are they? Uh, you know, please provide them. So check out Access Broadway again on the FUNYC pod.com website. We will have a link to Access Broadway New York.com. That'll be under the, what's, uh, I forget the tab on the website right now. I think it's support. Support, thank you. So you can go there and check them out. And, and I mean, Kevin could have changed it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but it's there. So go find that. Um, now, he's, he's you personally, uh, Maria, again, now Maria, I, uh, one of my favorite humans on the planet. I mean, it's amazing that you've done so much in such a little amount of time and that you rose very much uh, from a traumatic uh, thing to have this happen and to kind of refocus your life. Do you think the, 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 the you that you buried would be proud of the you that is now living? I think so. Yeah. I do. I think I probably would have ended up here somehow anyway. Right. 
if I'm being perfectly honest, I think, you know, the idea of bloodstain patterns and forensic psychology was super intriguing to me. But I definitely think I wanted more and to do more. And I probably would have ended up here in some capacity. I think you've done it uh, and continue yeah. to do it. And so if people want to find you personally on Instagram or social media, where are they finding you? Ooh, I am Maria Porto.2 on Instagram or Maria Porto on the face of books. Okay. But I'm not really on there that much. You can find me on Instagram. Instagram. And somebody else we could find on Instagram. Daisy the it's Wonder Daisy Dog, too. Oh, Daisy has her own handle. Oh, her little tail's wagging. She's people, like, follow me. Follow people me. like her Instagram more than mine, which is oh, fine. I mean, she's the best. Someone stole my dog's Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's really so, sad. So Daisy the Wonder Dog, too, yes. at Instagram. Oh. And now, we talked about this uh, before. You guys will go out and do fundraising and, and there was a competition. Tell that story real quick. There was a competition for fundraising, and Daisy got involved. It wasn't a competition. So we are avid Red Bucket uh, volunteers for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. It's an amazing organization on Broadway that does such wonderful things for the people on stage, off stage, backstage, um, and all around the world. And I was working with the kids over at Lion King, and you know, holding the bucket, they would do photos with people. This is pre COVID. Um, and I had to do something with them and I handed her the bucket just so I didn't have it in my hand so I could do something. And people started mass giving money to her. She's and, holding the bucket in her mouth. <laughs> yep. She has the little handle in her mouth and she holds the bucket. And then, you know, from there it kind of took off that, you know, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS had this volunteer dog that would go to random shows. And so they started booking us at different shows each night um, so that she could hold the bucket. And it's not so much a competition as they would give me a bucket and her a bucket and by the end of the night I would have like five dollars and she would have like four hundred right um, but I thought there was some of they 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 wouldn't count her total oh yeah that's when they were talking about like points and like how many people raise the most she always knocked everyone out right. of the water and so it just it wasn't fair after a while right biggest fundraiser for for all of that volunteer yes amazing so again, Marie Porter, thank you for being here. Let's let's talk some New York City specific questions. No, no reason to hide. Oh God. Uh, we'll start with some easy ones. What is your favorite movie set in New York City? The Great Gatsby. Oh. Mm. The new or the newer one with the no, Caprio? The oh yeah, that one. That one, the older one. It's like from ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, older one to me. Well, fair enough. <laughs> What's your favorite TV show set in New York? Law and Order. Because of the forensic yeah. study. Well, yeah. Which, yeah. Which one? That SVU. Oh, okay. Please. Uh, that or... Uh, uh, what was the other one that I really liked? What was it called? There's a little show called New si Amps. Seinfeld. No. I liked Seinfeld. I mean, I did. It was funny. Everybody's saying Law and Order or Seinfeld, so I thought maybe you said New Amsterdam. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was fun. That was okay. A show. There's a lot in New York shows. Uh, favorite musician or band to come out of New York City? The Beastie Boys. The oh, Beastie Boys. Oh, that is a good answer. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a very good one. What about favorite song about New York? I'm going to steal yours. It's still New York State of Mind. It's... I, I don't was think I can claim it as mine. I think that's, you know. No, I mean being your favorite. I'm. We do a lot of hiking on the Appalachian Trail, and if you are riding up the Hudson River line on Metro North, going up literally the New York City line, it is the best song to have bumping. Mm. It's it's a classic. I don't care. It's cliche, but I'm, I'm going to ride. Wait, is yours the Barbara Streisand version? Yeah. See? Yours wasn't. What? <laughs> What? <laughs> the Barbara Streisand version. No. What? You know what? We can agree to disagree. Oh, we're going to vehemently disagree. <laughs> wow, you're lucky I like you so much. <laughs> we're not going to be friends anymore. What did you do to me? <laughs> we'd violently disagree. Oh, my you God. You could have just left it at that. You've got days. Oh, my so God. The Barbara Streisand. Oh, my God. I don't know if you think I can what's, go on. Why such hate for Babs? I know. It's Billy Joel. Come on. That's I love terrible. Billy Joel. I'm not saying that he's not. I, I, I love that version, too. I didn't even know she too. performed that song. I didn't even know Billy Joel did originally. Oh, oh, oh that, that's a crime. <laughs> it's like we're told, in England, we just know Billy Joel as, like, Uptown Girl. 
That's you like okay, they, they, dis- you dis- dis- disclaimer. I'm I'm not with her on that one. <laughs> no, but in England, that's his like biggest hit. Oh my god! Yeah. Everyone loves Uptown Girl in England. Dear God, they love it. Fantastic. <laughs> Favorite food item in New York City? Food item. Like what you what do you have to eat here and only here? You're away for three months. You come back. First thing you got to eat when you land in New York City. Pizza. It's pizza. Pizza, because I go internationally and to California a lot, and anybody who tells you that California pizza is better than New York City pizza is absolutely insane. That's like someone saying Barbara Streisand's version. You know what? New York City is better than Billy Joel's. It's insane. No, it's not. (laughs) Go go eat at California Pizza Kitchen in California. That shit was whack. I agree. Just like saying Barbara's Barbara's version. California, California Pizza, pizza kitchen. kitchen. Yeah, and so is... <laughs> Listen, England. all y'all are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so is 80s Joel, apparently. <laughs> anyway. Yes, it's huge. Oh, my God. Favorite season in New York City? Oh, fall. Fall is the best season in New York City. I completely agree. <laughs> she hates this question. Hate Why? Because everyone says fall. Because it's the Except best. Except they don't. We've had spring, and right. your favorite is... Summer? Right. No. Why, exactly. Why would you I like summer, summer in the city? Oh, yeah. I love it. I just love it. Do you love the steam coming out the smell. of yeah, like the steam coming out of the subway? Yes. Does that I refresh just love you? The sunshine. Emily, I feel like Emily enjoys. Happier. Emily enjoys a good stench. <laughs> is yeah, what well, it is. I sit next to you for a podcast for a few hours a week. I smell <laughs> fantastic right now. I dress like shit, but I smell great. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I think we know the answer to this one. Mm-hmm. Oh no, we've already discussed it. Favorite charity in New York ah, City? Yes. Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. We have been a longstanding member of the Red Bucket Brigade and all the work that they do. Yes. Is... And all the work Daisy does to support as well. I have a question on that one. Of course. Does Daisy come from a particular charity or is there a charity? Yes. The working dogs that we can also support? Yeah. So this charity is actually outside of New York City. Uh, her organization is called Pause with a Cause. Um, they are out of Wayland, Michigan. They are the top notch uh, for service dogs for people around the country. They literally send these dogs around the country. Um, and I've been working with them for the last 11 years. Wow. And they placed Daisy with me seven years ago. Let's add that to the website as well. Absolutely. And people should know, too, you know, on the subject of adopting or shopping, all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of a lot of these service dogs go through training and they don't yep. make it. It doesn't mean they're bad dogs. It just means they. it's a very specialized thing. I think it's 70% don't make it. It's a pretty high number. Yeah, and they cannot make it for any kind of reason. Right. One, one of her brothers had allergies. Right. So it's, oh. it's nothing to do with them being, you know, they're still – you're getting a tremendous dog and it may cost a little bit. It's a donation. You fill out a, a, a form for an adoption and it's a donation and it might cost a few more bucks than going to a breeder, but you're supporting an amazing organization. I do some work with the seeing eye foundation in Morristown. Same thing. Um, again, it's a, definitely something I think people don't think about looking into. Mm-hmm. They just assume that you can't get the, you can, and you get, you maybe get yourself a wonderful dog and support a great cause in the process. You're not going to get a Daisy. Sorry to tell you, but you well, know. you may get a dog that just brings you random things because right. this training is still there. <laughs> right. But you're not getting a daisy, but you'll get oh. something uh, close. And the last question, I think we know the answer to this too, but is go ahead. your closest near-death experience in New York? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so fun. Um, I, you know, got an Uber one time. And he came up and he was very angry about the dog um, going with me. And oh he had gosh. opened his back pas- uh, back passenger window and I had leaned over and I wear a cross the body bag and it got caught in a door handle and he drove off <gasps> with me and Daisy <gasps> attached to the car. Um, we screamed and he stopped for like a minute and I have no idea what happened. I assume he started yelling, but then he spud- sped off with us. We got dragged like half a block. Uh, until the strap broke and then they transported me and Daisy to a trauma room uh, at Harlem Hospital and it was I I was more upset because my dog was injured than me Um, and so Daisy they had shout out to Harlem Hospital they took care of her they immediately created her they dressed all her road you know rashes and that was our do they find this guy yeah that really pisses me off did Uber do anything about this I don't know if Uber ever did anything but the cops uh it was an Uber driver, so I had his license plate number. It wasn't that hard to turn it over. And I guess, and and this is, you know, shout out to New York City, though. 
F New York City on a lot of things, especially when it comes to mm-hmm. transportation. But there was a guy who was in the car behind us who chased this dude until, you know, he stopped and he got a cop. And so I guess the guy got arrested. But shout out to that guy. Yeah, I, well done. Was that, is that, is that uh, court case still pending or? No, this was years ago. Do we know he got, did he, did he get prosecuted? We don't He's know. I don't, think, I don't think he got prosecuted. Still driving for Uber. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think he got Sad prosecuted, day. but I do know that they had me like fill out like a statement and all that stuff. But well, I'm glad you're okay. Yeah, I'm glad too. Daisy's okay. I was more so upset about Daisy. Daisy. I, you know, I'm equally upset. <laughs> I am so upset. Yeah. I was like, I'll live. Again. Yeah, no, it poor Daisy. It makes me Daisy. so mad that people like that. Well, again, we've been getting a lot of fun stories with that question. That's definitely <laughs> yeah, the most that's definitely horrific the most one. F-U. Yeah, you NYC said near death. Question. No, that's no. that counts. I guess we were expecting about the NYPD cop. You know, that was that was near death as well. But the. You know, yeah, yeah. That's awful. the most traumatic one was when my dog was involved. the The thing with the cop was just me. Yeah. So I feel like I do a lot better when it's just me. I have to worry. Maybe about. Maybe we should um ask Uber as an apology to maybe send a good donation to <laughs> Access Broadway, and the Pause for Cause charities as an apology. I can occur. So so anyway, again, Maria Porto, thank you for being here. Uh, Tremendous pleasure having you. Again, one of my favorite people in the world and far and away my favorite dog in the world. Yeah, I am in so. awe. I am blown away by your story. The fact that you, what you've been through and you just help people is just so amazing. I hope you know how special you are. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been super fun. Oh, yeah. It's no, my first time. You're welcome back anytime. So Podcast. Uh, so anytime again. Anytime you want to smell the stench of Eric. <laughs> yeah. So just not in summer then. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> Right, don't come in summer. It's a terrible season. <laughs> so, hey, thanks for tuning in. This is FUNYC. I'm your co-host, Eric Wickstrom. And I'm your co-host, Emily Eden. Again, check us out at FUNYC Pod. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're everywhere you stream podcasts. And check out the scripted version of Emily's adapted novel, FUNYC, same name. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.